So this morning we continue in a fall series, a series that I told you originally began in the 4th century when a man by the name of Evagrius of Pontus, upon reflecting on his Christian life and faith, identified eight sins, eight areas in the Christian life of difficulty, of frustration, and of failure. And that later in the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great took that list of eight, reduced it to a list of seven, which has historically been known as the seven deadly sins. Now through a Catholic lens, I've told you and reminded you that they viewed sin as either mortal or venial that were some sins, venial sins, were, were slight. They had some ill effect. But there were other sins that were mortal, that would cost you your soul. And we view sin differently in our understanding of what the Scriptures teach. We view that any one sin condemns a sinner in the presence of a holy God. But we do agree on the consuming nature of sin and that there are particular areas in life that tend to dominate every one of us. And since that's true, we, we're taking the time to look at these seven typical tripping points, these seven typical categories that can undo a person, that can consume them, that can dominate them, that can ruin their lives. And that's all been, I hope, pretty practical. I hope at the end of the day it's been encouraging and not discouraging. But we began, and all of this is available online. If you would like a, an outline or the, the audio of the sermon, it's all available online if you missed any weeks. But in week one, we considered the sin of pride, how it is the root, the queen of all sin. Everything seems to be rooted in our own personal and selfish pride and our rebellion against God and His created order. Then we considered envy, that the human heart is an envious heart and it can want what other people have. It can even envy the lives, the stories that God has given other people. And your heart can clench like a fist with envy because you're mad that somebody else's story is the story that you wanted. And that's the story of the envious heart. Then we considered the sin of anger. How our unjust anger is that inward burning where we want to pour our wrath. We want to pour out our justice upon anyone or anything that is contrary to our own will. And then we considered the greedy heart. The sin of greed. That insatiable desire within the human heart to satisfy itself with money, with possessions, with stuff. And how greed ultimately leaves us empty-handed in the end because every created thing can be ruined by rust and by moth and by decay. And then last week, we considered the sin of sloth what the Bible calls the sluggard. But we heard that it's even more than laziness. The slothful heart is apathetic towards God. It's indifferent towards the things of God. It's purposeless. It lacks drive in everyday life. It's helpless and hopeless within itself. So that's what we've considered so far. And then this morning we come to the sixth of the seven, and it's my specialty. It's the sin of gluttony. It's the gluttonous heart. More to say this morning than I can say, and I hope to say it sincerely. I hope it to be helpful to you. But all of these sins share something in common, and that is that they are consuming in nature. They want to dominate your heart, my heart, 
all of us. They want to deplete our God-given joy. They want to disintegrate our everyday purpose and how we live. And ultimately, they want to condemn us. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, those who believe the gospel of Jesus, I want you to hear, as we've heard with other, the other six, the other five, that the gospel's not just the forgiveness of our sins. It's power to change. It's deep change that the gospel can work in every one of our lives. And in that way, it's, the gospel's been called the double cure for sin. It cleanses us both from the guilt of our sin and the power of sin in our lives. And so as we get into the nitty-gritty of, of these sins, um, you could be discouraged, but only if you don't hear the hope of forgiveness and the power for change. And that's what we believe at GPC. So this morning, gluttony, how our own appetites seek to consume us. How our own appetites seek to consume us. A lot of scriptures we'll hear this morning, but the primary one to begin with is selections from Proverbs chapter 23. Those of you who were here when we preached through the Psalms for a few weeks, you might remember that I highlighted Psalm 1 as the gateway to the Psalter and that it laid before us that there are two paths that can be walked. The path of wisdom, the path of folly, and that we are to choose the path of wisdom, right? And the rest of the Psalms speak to that. Well, the Proverbs speak to those two paths also. You're going to hear that this morning in Proverbs 23. And we're to walk the path of wisdom as it comes to food and drink and not the path of folly. So give your attention. Selections from Proverbs 23. Listen, my son, and be wise. And set your heart on the right path. Do not join with those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor. And drowsiness clothes them in rags. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Let's pray that the Lord would help us understand a Difficult subject. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be wise in how we live. We don't want to be religious. We want to be righteous. And Lord, on the subject of food and drink, so many of us struggle. But this morning we seek your grace, your mercy, your strength, your wisdom, your righteousness that we could be a different kind of people, the kind of people you've called us to be. We ask this, we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the subject of my specialty. I say that uh, comically but seriously. I love food. You hear me talk about food a lot in my sermons. I love food. You love food. We all love food food. I scream. You scream. We all scream for ice cream, right? Uh, A little bit more sophisticated. Charles Dickens in Oliver said this. This is the song some of you could sing. 
Listen to the worship of food, by the way. Food, glorious food. We're anxious to try it. Three banquets a day, our favorite diet. Just picture a great big steak, fried, roasted, or stewed. Oh, food, magical food, wonderful food, marvelous food. What wouldn't we give for that extra bit more? That's all we live for. Why should we be fated to do nothing but to brood on food? Magical food, wonderful food, marvelous food, beautiful food, food, glorious food, glorious food. And there you hear literally the language of the Bible that's ascribed to God and His worship attributed to food. And if if you're like me, you, you get it. Right? I've been known to break out in song when enjoying a good meal. It's so good. This is wonderful. Right? Now, those of you who enjoy food like I do, you resonate with that. Others of you are like, I just don't really care about food. I've known a few people like this in my life, and they frustrate me. Right? I have known two people in my life, one at GPC, who don't like chocolate. And I just don't understand that. But so for the rest of us who who food, who drink, who the enjoyment of these good gifts can be an issue, God's Word has much to say, much of it in giving us boundaries, much of us in giving us a gentle prod and a good direction, and much of it calling us to restrain the unbridled misuse and abuse of these good gifts of God. Three points for you this morning, and they're the same as they've been for each of these sin subjects. The first is this, gluttony, what it is according to Scripture. The second, gluttony, what it looks like in our everyday life. And then thirdly, gluttony, how the gospel has power to redeem our appetites. But let's begin with what gluttony is according to Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Paul says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. Which is to say, keep everything in its proper context. Don't abuse, don't misuse, don't think you have more freedom than you actually do. Be very cautious in light of judgment. Defined, gluttony is an excessive desire for the consumption of food. Some people are excessively interested, preoccupied with, able to really, 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 really enjoy food. And that's either you or that's not you. But we could say it is quite literally in that sense a perverted appetite. There's nothing wrong with an appetite, but this is an appetite gone bad. This is an appetite gone to an extreme. Food, we know, is given to us as fuel. Food is to fuel us. But at the same time, food can be so enjoyable, such a blessing. And so which is it? And we would say, biblically, it's both. Food is fuel for everyday life. But biblically, feasts are a thing. But they are occasional. They're not daily And they're certainly not three times a day as they tend to be in our abundant culture. Proverbs chapter 25. If you have found honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. So even from earliest times, before you could find restaurants on every corner... Even when being able to indulge of honey and honeycomb, when you had to go find that, people would overdo it. 
And so this is something about the human heart, the human nature that has always been true. But it's never been easier than it is for us. Where within a five minutes drive, how many different cuisines could you go find from how many different countries... And how much of it could you get in a serving? How much of it could you enjoy? So ultimately, food is fuel. It is to be enjoyed in a feast. But those are to be rare occasions. On the subject of gluttony, Thomas Aquinas said this. He says there's not one way to be gluttonous with food. He says there's five ways to be gluttonous with food. He said we're gluttonous with food when we eat too much which is what you and I tend to think of gluttony as being. He says it's, we're, we're gluttonous when we eat too often, when there's no regulation to our meals and we're just eating all the time. He says we're gluttonous when, uh, with our food when we eat too eagerly. And he says we're gluttonous with our food when we eat too expensively, that is wastefully, and too fastidiously, which is pickiness being very delicate about what you eat, which tends to be very expensive in what we eat. So there's all kinds of ways to be gluttonous. And one important thing I want us to all hear this morning is that we can be gluttonous with more than food. We tend to think of food, that's the obvious application, but you and I can be gluttonous with all kinds of things. More on that in a moment. Gluttony also is an abuse and a misuse of God's good gifts. This is not a sermon against food. There's nothing wrong with food. What's gone wrong is our sinful hearts and their appetites and what they seek to enjoy and why they seek to enjoy enjoy it. One author has said this, There are many sources of pain in this life. Some come from relationships. Some of it is physical. Some comes from the trio of guilt, shame, and worthlessness. Wherever it comes from, the tragic mistake is to take a good gift of God and to misuse it in an attempt to bury pain in the pursuit of pleasure. Now, what he's just said there is really significant, and that's where food becomes center stage in our conversation. He says the thing that we do is we'll take the good gifts of God and we'll look to them to comfort us when we hurt from sin in this sinful world. And he says that's where you get it backwards. You get it reversed. So think of it this way. You you have a bad day. Guys, she breaks up with you. Uh, Girls, he breaks up with you. Well, that's not anything a little mint chocolate chip ice cream won't help, right? Uh, Or maybe a few brownies. Slather a little peanut butter on there and a little bit of vanilla ice cream. and, And then it's all better for a few minutes, right? And then it gets worse. I hate myself. Why did I do that? I feel so guilty. Right? We will use created things to try to serve as a balm to the hurts of this life, to the wounds of this life. And that's where the Scriptures say we get things wrong, we get things backward. But again, not all food, not feasting in general is wrong. So this is not a sermon against feasting, but everything has to have its proper context and its proper balance, and that's where we get it long. Consider the words in Nehemiah chapter 8, where we're told, Go, eat rich foods, and drink sweet drinks, and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened this day, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. And I use that as a positive example that that food is a part of worship. It's a part of fellowship. It's a part of community. But not every day is a day for feasting. Not every meal is a meal for feasting. Everything in its proper context and all of it done rejoicing in the Lord. All of it done with the Lord in mind. That's why Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
Do it all for the glory of God. And there is our context according to scriptures. That is what the scriptures say. Gluttony as an abuse and misuse of God's, God's gifts historically has been called concupiscence. Concupiscence is a consuming desire, which is bad, but for an otherwise good thing. There's nothing wrong with the food. What goes wrong is the consuming desire within us. Think of Genesis chapter 25 and the story of Jacob and Esau where the birthright is sold because of an appetite, because of a physical appetite. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, Well, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and got up and left, and so Esau despised his birthright. Now that story tells us much about human appetite. It tells us much about the human heart. It tells us much about the spiritual condition. And that is that our our appetites can consume us. They can dominate us. They can destroy us. And that's what concupiscence is. It's an overwhelming desire that influences the person. All of these are disordered affections. The affections of our heart, the passions of our heart, they're all skewed because of sin. I've told you before, it's like our our factory settings, the dials and switches and knobs of the dashboard of our soul. They're all off their factory settings. And so some are easily dominated by one thing, whereas other people are like, no, I'm more dominated by this thing. But that's the passion, the desire, the consuming desire of the heart and of the soul. And in the end of the day, the Bible calls it idolatry. That consuming must have passion for anything that's less than God Himself with the belief that it will provide what God alone Himself can provide. Comfort, release, satisfaction. All of those things are ultimately found in God and in His gospel. But we get it wrong because we look to created things rather than the Creator. Disordered affections of the human heart. That's true of me. That's true of you. There is a right practice of feasting. There's a wrong practice of feasting. But food is all around us. And you've got decisions to make. And I have decisions to make. Because we will be dominated by those things. Okay, so um, think about the announcements in church this morning. Think about the events on the church calendar. Everything we do, we seek to do intentionally and purposefully and with redemptive causes, uh, but in my own life. So we hosted the youth last night for a swing dance at the barn. It was great. Beautiful fall night. Right, everybody? And we had chili dogs and potato chips and s'mores. And this Thursday, we're going to have the men's fellowship at the barn. And we're going to have burrito bowls and fajita bowls nacho bowls, and then comes Sunday, and we're going to have the barbecue hymn sing. And you're bringing side items and desserts, and Ken Bain and I are cooking 32 Boston butts for these 400 people that we're told will be there. There's a lot of food in the life of the church, isn't there? I had two lunches and a nice dinner out this week. We're surrounded by food everywhere. You've got to walk into those things prepared and mentally thinking about, how am I going to handle this? Otherwise, we could bait people into a gluttonous life and have some responsibility for it. The youth are going to have pizza tonight. We have pizza every Sunday night. But we're forming appetites now 
and the need for wisdom and discipline are always a part of our decisions. So scripturally, we would be told, be careful, be cautious. You know, playfully, maybe the next men's fellowship needs to be a long walk, right? So we do want to balance these things carefully. We want to live with wisdom and discipline and be very honest. Every one of us is learning to make decisions or we're dying by the decisions that we're making. And all of this, I'm speaking to myself more than I'm speaking to you. Secondly, what does gluttony look like in everyday life? Very practically speaking. I remember as a little boy being introduced to the icy cold bottle of a Coca-Cola. And my memory is that those first portions that you could buy, they were six ounce bottles. Remember that? There were also 10 ounce bottles. But then that wasn't enough and we were introduced to the 12 ounce can. Then you might remember after that came the 16 ounce plastic bottles. And then more recently the 20 ounce bottles. I remember that for families, um, what they sold in, in glass bottles at the time, so this is like late 70s I guess, uh, one liter family servings. Then came the two liter family servings. And then do you remember? I don't know if you can get them anymore, but there were three liter family servings. Those ginormous bottles that were too big for kids to pour. And that's probably why they got rid of them was all the train wreck at home. You might also remember um, the big gulp. When suddenly the portion you could get at the QT, fast fare, whatever it was, 44 ounces for a serving. And, and this is our culture. This is the land of abundance, and we love it. Don't even talk about taking it away from me, right? McDonald's introduced us to supersizing, where individual servings became probably enough calories for four people. I don't know. I didn't do the math, but I loved it. I still love it. And that's the culture in which we live. Food is so available. As a matter of fact, in 2005, um, Saturday Night Live, which I don't always quote in sermons, um, but when they provide it, I'll take it. In 2005, uh, one of my favorite skits, this is back when Saturday Night Live was actually funny, but it's a skit called Taco Town. And you can watch the clip on your computer this afternoon. But it's three men in a taco bar enjoying and laughing, eating their Mexican food. And then the commentator comes on and voices over. And he's going to introduce a new product, a new taco product. And they're making fun of our American culture and our obsession with food. But listen to this description as they overwhelm the, the human ear with this description of food. Food. The new product, he says, we take a crunchy, all-beef taco, smother it in nacho cheese, lettuce, tomato, and our special southwestern sauce. Then we wrap it in a soft flour tortilla with a layer of refried beans in between. Then we wrap that in a savory corn tortilla with a middle layer of Monterey Jack cheese. And it gets even awesomer when we take a deep-fried gordita shell, smear on a little special guacamolito sauce, and wrap that on the outside. But it gets even bigger because we bake it in a corn husk filled with pico de gallo, then wrap that in an authentic Parisian crepe filled with egg, gruyere, sausage, and portobello mushrooms. But not before we take the whole thing and wrap that in a Chicago-style deep-dish meat lover's pizza. But it's not a Taco Town taco until we roll it all up in a blueberry pancake. <laughs> Dip it in batter and deep-fry it until it's golden brown. Then we serve it in a commemorative tote bag filled with spicy vegetarian chili. It's 15 great tastes all rolled up into one. And they're playing off our being targets 
of more is better. Now here's the funny thing. You get to the end of that fake commercial on Saturday Night Live, and my memory was, hmm, I think I'd eat that. (laughs) I'd at least try it, right? That's our culture. That's what it looks like in everyday life. And it's comical. It's, It's laughable. We have perversions of food, and food will dominate us. General Thomas Jackson, also known as Stonewall Jackson, models some discipline and some principle on this subject. He said this. His principle for his life was, Eat not to dullness. Drink not to elevation. Which is his way of saying, Okay, I need some boundaries. Uh, it's also said that he once ate buttered bread. And he, re- he commented out loud after he ate it, That was so good, I will never eat it again. Now that's a self-discipline. That's a purposed individual. But what, when he says, Eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. There's an example of somebody putting some, some guardrails in their life. And you know what eating to dullness is. Right? Some of you are going to do that in about 90 minutes. You know, you go to the Chinese buffet and you walk in and you're like, I'm so hungry, this is so good. And and you you overdo it and you walk out and you're like, two things. I need a nap. That's the dullness, right? And I never want to eat Chinese food again. Only two hours later after the nap, you're like, you know, I I could do that again. Right? That's the human heart. That's how we are. Those are the cycles that we can get caught into. But eat not to the point of dullness. Drink not to the point of elevation. That perhaps, those are perhaps the principles that you and I should apply in our everyday lives. Historically, this has been true. Um, students might find this interesting, but there are articles online about ancient Rome and how they would eat, and their use of food and drink. And there's some very interesting competing articles out there on the subject of the vomitorium. And interestingly, some say it existed, others say it didn't exist. This was a room that would exist uh, for the purpose of, of causing one to throw up during a feast so that they could eat more, right? And there's a good argument that that there weren't actual rooms. But even the article that I read... So the funny thing is, the person who said these did not exist was writing from Denver, Denver, Colorado. The person who was writing that these did exist and it was a real issue was writing from Rome. So when considering the Romans, decide if you're going to listen to the person in Denver, Colorado or Rome. But what was said by those who said they didn't exist... They did admit this. This is from the Contrarian article. According to the historian Suetonius, who was secretary of correspondence in the emperor Hadrian, the emperor Claudius always finished his meals excessively bloated with food and with wine. He would then lie down so that a feather could be inserted down his throat to make him disgorge the contents of his stomach. Claudius's excesses paled in comparison to the emperor Vitellius, who allegedly feasted four times a day and procured exotic foods from all over the empire to satiate his enormous appetite, including brains of pheasants and flamingo tongues. He is said to have vomited between meals in order to make room for the next banquet. So it seems that the real argument is whether or not there was a room called the vomitorium. But the use of purging for the sake of eating more seems to be agreed upon as a practice historically. That's a visible and gross picture of our abuse of food. It's around us. It's available to us. It is an issue. They are issues. But it's not just perversions of food. Proverbs 23 spoke about the abuse of drink. And we know that's an issue in our culture. So whether food or drink, the appetite... It's really really a sermon that could be called 
death by appetite. How our appetites will kill us. How our appetites will consume us. And with drink, I want to highlight two issues. Number one, it's not that drink is wrong. It's not that drink is bad. There's nothing wrong with the good gift of God. It's the overconsumption, the misuse, the abuse of it. And that's what the Scriptures warn us of. And some are given to that temptation and being enslaved by it more than others because the switches and knobs on all of us are different. But everyone needs to be cautious with these gifts because our sinful hearts will abuse them. So overconsumption is the issue. But just to be clear as pastor and for a moment, let me talk about underage consumption. Remember, I used to work in student ministry, and I would highlight that for this reason, because there are good, well-meaning Christians who don't understand that when the law of the land says you're too young to drink, then we agree you're too young to drink. There's too many things that can go wrong. And so we submit when the law of the land and Caesar gives a reasonable law like that that's not contrary to Scripture, we agree. And some of you maybe have been put in or are being put in or are about to be put in situations where you could compromise. But just to be clear from, from the pulpit, underage consumption would be a sin. That would be wrong. That would not be the way of wisdom. That would be the way of folly. It would be a way to get on the wrong path, the path of folly, at a young age. And some of you maybe have friends that have done this or are doing that. We would say pray for them, pray wisdom for them, pray discipline for them. But all of us can be dominated by these perversions of food and drink. And it begins at an early age and we should be cautious. We should talk about it in the church. Okay, thirdly and lastly, how does the gospel have anything to do with any of that? How does the gospel have power to change, to redeem our appetites. Well, we heard it already in what the Apostle Paul said as the way in which we live. Our, our motto for food and drink should be this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Keep everything in its proper context. There are created things that can be enjoyed. But there is a creator of those created things who gives us the context for their enjoyment. When we talk about the gospel, we're always talking about three things. That is justification, sanctification, and glorification. And when we talk about justification, we're talking about the truth that God has power to forgive the guilt of our sin. But we're also talking about sanctification, that God has power to work deep change, even as it affects our hearts and the appetites of our hearts. God has the power by His Spirit to work self-control, self-discipline into the lives of His people. Paul says it in Galatians 5, in the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, discipline, is listed That's what the Holy Spirit works in people. So we need not be dominated and controlled by any created things. God has power to redeem appetites and desires, and that is of every kind. Anything of the flesh marred by sin, God by His Spirit has power to transform and to change. And it's not going to be instantaneous. It's going to require some self-discipline and obedience But we're told that God works that way deeply in people. Lisa Turkhurst, in her book called Made to Crave, Satisfying Your Deepest Desire with God, Not with Food, says this. She had a lifelong, has had a lifelong battle with food and getting in it in its proper context. Two quotes from her. She said, I've learned I'm not on a diet. I'm on a journey to learn the fine art of self-discipline for the purpose of holiness. 
Then she said this, and this resonates with me. I was made for more than being stuck in a vicious cycle of defeat. I'm not made to be a victim of my poor choices. I was made to be a victorious child of God. And so whether it's food or any other thing we can be gluttonous with, we can be gluttonous with issues of control, we can be gluttonous with desire for attention, we can be gluttonous with anything, anything we look to to satisfy. That in the end of the day is not what we were made for. Those things were to serve us. We're not to serve them. We're not to serve food. We're not to be controlled by food. We were made to glorify and enjoy God and to learn in this life to see everything put in its right context until one day God will ultimately put everything in its perfect context. Right? It was Jesus who said in John 6 that we heard earlier this morning, His words on food and Himself as the true food of heaven. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to Me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in Me will never be thirsty. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him, shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Jesus is our bread from heaven. Jesus is the true food that our souls can feed upon. If you're like me, labor to put earthly food in its proper context. It's to be enjoyed as a feast on occasions. Not every day. Not three days Not three meals every day. But when we eat, we eat, we drink to the glory of God. Not with guilty consciences, but with thankful hearts. One of the greatest stories, movies about food is Willy Wonka. A lot of stories of appetite, abuse, misuse, the ruin of the human heart, the consumption of the person by sin. But in the 2005 remake, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Charlie, who loves his chocolate and who's offered the chance to go to the chocolate factory, he asks if it is going to cost him his family. He's told it will cost him everything. And Charlie, like a little type of Christ, says this, I wouldn't give up my family for all the chocolate in the world. And it's a beautiful, sweet little moment where Charlie reminds us in that way he's, he's like the Lord Jesus. He won't be distracted by the, the food, the pleasures, the delicacies of this life. His heart has not been swayed by the chocolate. His heart has been consumed by his love for his family. And that's the heart of Jesus for His church. He knows your sins. He knows your appetites. He knows the misuse and abuse that sin has wreaked in all of our hearts. But He's not going to give us up to those. He's not going to abandon us. He wouldn't give us up for all the chocolate in the world. And what He says is there is a day coming. I'll close with this. There is a day coming where where food and drink will be put in its right context forever. And it's the day that we all feast together in Zion, in His heaven. And until then, we'll have our struggles, our failures with our sinful hearts. We'll look to Him for the forgiveness of our sins. We'll pray for the power to change, 
to not be dominated by sin. But there's a day coming, the day where we will feast in the house of Zion. and We will weep no more. We're going to sing that. We're going to pray that. But let me pray for us first. Lord, we're convicted by our own sin and ruin and guilt that we can't even get food and drink right. But Lord, you have made us right because of the death of your son. No more to be dominated by sin. No longer to be dominated by created things. But Lord, would you set our hope in heaven above, our confidence in what you have done for us, Do this, Lord, even as we sing this song. Encourage our hearts for the day that is to come when all things will be made right. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.